Good evening and welcome to Product Tank October. I'm Liz Clow. I am one of the Product Tank London organisers and really looking forward to introducing you to this evening's event. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. So First of all, um, I want to tell you a little bit about Product Tank because some of you that will be joining will be um, familiar with us. Some of you will have joined before, but ultimately Product Tank operates in over 200 cities around the world. Um, you know, what started as an idea um, amongst a group of like-minded people here in the UK has, has grown enormously. And hopefully, you know, through these uh, through, through these times where we're uh, attending and hosting events virtually, you can also look at opportunities to join other Product Tank events around the world. As I say, 200 plus cities, we're here from London and, uh, and I'm sure many of you are joining us from around the world. So what does uh, Product Tank offer? Well, here tonight we've got some live speakers for you, but also we have our YouTube channel where you can look back over the other events we've been hosting over the last few months. So they're all there for you to watch on demand. And then also we've got a couple more events coming up before the end of the year. So in your diaries, uh, you know, make sure you make a note of the 18th of November. Uh, we have a product tank uh, event coming up that date. And then, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a tease for December. This is a, a new date that we've added in the 9th of December we're gonna be hosting a little bit of a Christmas debate. So um, mark that one in your diaries as well. So Product Tank is part of the Mind the Product community and Mind the Product is the world's largest product community. And you know, through this, we obviously have, you know, in, in pre-COVID times, our, our in-person uh, live uh, meetups. Um, we also have, uh, Minor Product has, uh, you know, an email newsletter that they send out loads of articles that you can read on their website, articles, videos, etc. And then Minor Product also has their own Slack channel. So if you don't get enough from uh, from these events, from what you can find on the website, etc., you can connect with like-minded people on the Minor Product Slack channel. And also, Mind the Product has their membership uh, as well. And you can see on the screen here, go out to their, go over to their website to check it out in more detail. But uh, a lot of free content out there on Mind the Product, but really to, to get the, you know, the, the largest access, there's the prioritized and the leader memberships that you can also opt into. So lots of exclusive opportunities there for you to become a Mind the Product member and, you know, really, uh, get access to the you know the greatest uh, content around and the access to really amazing uh, product experts from around the world. All of that information, as I say, is on the Mind the Product website, so please do take a look. And coming up, we're in a virtual world, but uh, next month, 18th to the 19th of November is MTPCon Digital. There's an amazing setup of speakers lined up. Some of them are there on the screen now, uh, but there's so many more than I can I can fit on this slide. Again, go over to their websites, coming uh, virtually on the 18th and 19th of November. Plenty of tickets available, so uh, take a look at the lineup and the format, and uh, uh, I'm sure many of you will want to, uh, to sign up to MTPCon Digital. Also, remote training workshops um, are very much in full swing from the Minor Product team, covering a wide range of topics with an amazing uh, bunch of uh, uh, trainers. So take a look there if there's an opportunity for you to level up your skills or, you know, try something new, then take a look at the training workshop options there are there as well. And now for tonight. So if you have a question tonight for our speakers who you're going to be introduced to very shortly, then it's really simple. We would love to hear your questions. So we have three speakers tonight and at the end we always save time for a Q&A. So really think about them, post them in uh, to the chat uh, as and when you'd like to and we'll make sure that we cover off as many of them as possible towards the end of the evening. So it's very simple, log into your YouTube account, click on the show the cat 
show the chat uh, button and then you can post your question right in there and we will be looking through all the questions and selecting as many of them as we can towards the end of the uh, event just after the speakers have completed. And so now I'm going to hand over to our curator for this evening. So Caroline Parnell um, is our curator. She is the one that has really pulled the, the speakers together, you know, thought about the event and, and how to, um, you know, bring uh, quite a wide range of topics in this uh, complex product uh, landscape to, uh, to, to, to you this evening. So on this note, I'm going to hand over to Caroline. She's going to introduce herself and introduce you to the speakers for this evening. So Caroline, thank you and over to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, and just to reiterate Liz's point, thank you to everyone who's joining us um, this evening for our product tank topic around uh, talking about complex products. So as Liz says, I'll just give a really quick introduction to myself and then I'll, I'll move on to introduce you to the speakers that we've got uh, for this evening. So my name is Caroline Parnell and um, I've managed products teams for about the last uh, sort of 20 odd years across companies like Vodafone and, and O2. Um, and when Liz kindly asked me to curate the event tonight, um, I thought a bit about you know, what, what do I take to mean from complex products? What do I think would be some interesting topics to talk about? I think we can probably all relate to the fact that most products are complicated um, in one way or another. They all have their own uh, sort of quirks and challenges. But there were sort of three areas that kept coming up for me that I thought would be interesting to explore. So the first one was around products where they have a hardware and software element and some of the challenges of them bringing those products to market when you've got the both sides uh, of, of the product to think about. The second area was looking at products where they have uh, customer experiences that span online as well as offline um, and some of the challenges that that brings. And then the third area was looking at the challenge of working with new or emerging sort of technologies, so things like sort of AI and robotics um, and how to manage that. So that's what I used in terms of um, selecting speakers uh, this evening. Um, and we really do have three amazing speakers uh, with us tonight that are going to help us explore some of those topics and, and much more aspects, I'm sure. Um, so we've got Keith, uh, Emily and uh, Matthew joining us tonight. Um, and they're going to be sharing some of their experiences and insights across a whole variety of really interesting uh, sectors and brands that they've worked at and, and give us some really useful takeaways that we can then uh, learn from their experience. So first up, we're going to have uh, Keith. Uh, so Keith uh, is a senior product owner um, at the AA. And Keith's going to talk to us about how to deliver digital products in complex non-digital organisations. Keith will be followed by um, Emily. Um, Emily's a product director who's had some really interesting experience across uh, startups, scale-ups, and large corporates as well, including brands such as Babylon and, and Microsoft. Um, so Emily's gonna be sharing her insights around navigating the complexities um, of AI, which would be really interesting. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from um, Matthew. So Matthew's the head of product um, at Ocado uh, Technology. Um, and Matthew's going to be sharing his uh, top five tips for organising teams around the development of complex products. And as Liz mentioned, please, we do want your questions. So please do uh, post your questions as the talks are going on. And I'll make a note of those questions for our Q&A session um, at the end. So Keith's going to kick us off tonight. So I'll just give a quick intro uh, to Keith. So Keith and I worked together for a short period when we were both at um, O2. And the reason why I really wanted Keith to talk to us tonight was Keith's got um, some brilliant experiences across a number of different sectors and a number of different really interesting brands. So Keith's worked at organisations such as uh, the AA, Yell.com, uh, British Gas, Vodafone, uh, Costa Coffee. It's a really good, uh, diverse mix of experience. Um, and Keith's going to be sharing some of those experiences um, in his talk in terms of how delivering some of those complex products. As an aside, Keith uh, does also have his own uh, podcast that he's part of, uh, the brilliantly named uh, Three Shaved Heads, which I do like. Um, so I'm sure he'll be very keen if you could uh, check that out at the end of this session um, as well. So huge welcome to Keith, who's our first speaker for this evening. Hey everyone, thank you Caroline and uh, thanks to the organisers for this opportunity. It, it actually really means a lot to me to be speaking at a product tank event as we come closer to the end of this year, which I know has been a, a really difficult year for lots of people. 
In fact, I've had my own share of job-related problems this year, some of which have actually shaped what I'm going to talk about this evening. Uh, and actually losing my job due to the pandemic back in March gave me some, some really valuable time, which enabled me to think about my career in ways that I perhaps may not have otherwise been able to do. I actually spent a total of about four months out of work this year. So I really, I, I just can't explain how relieved I am to be working again. Uh, and going from having a sudden job loss about six months ago to, to then being invited here last month really helped me, you know, get, lock onto something positive to aim for. So, so thank you for that. So as I said, I started what, what for me was the perfect job back in March, and it was in the travel industry. So unsurprisingly, given everything that's happened to global travel, it came to rather an abrupt end about four weeks after I started. I'd, I'd really agonized over taking that job. I'd left the relative comfort of a 20-year career in, in large enterprises to jump into a small family firm of about 45 people. But it was a business who really wanted to embrace digital, true agile working, full cross-functional squads, OKRs, all those good things that us product people who sit in giant, complex businesses can often only really read about. So my decision last year to make the move was based on this. It was a bit of a realization that for me, there were three things that really bothered me about my career so far in product. One, I've never worked in a startup or a small business. Two, I've never disrupted anything. And three, I've never really worked in the ways that all the product books say I should be working in. So when I found myself suddenly job hunting and during a pandemic, and I can tell you that's not easy, something happened that it, it really crushed me and it confirmed my fears. I'd wanted to find a similar role, and I received some feedback from a recruiter that I hadn't got an interview for a job I'd applied for because the hiring manager, who I'd actually crossed paths with before, knew some about some of the products I'd worked on in the past. In their eyes, I didn't have real product experience. It really hurt and just really confirmed my feelings about my apparent career inadequacies. And I believe my lack of startups, disruption, and only having a small experience with the purest of pure agile meant my value in the product community wasn't worth much. But with time on my hands, I begin to ask myself, well, what is real product experience? Do you have to have experienced a startup, disrupted something, and refused to acknowledge the existence of Waterfall to be a real product person? I realized I was wrong. My seven years in product, 14 in web design and UX, an experience across large and sometimes very complex companies. Sometimes those companies had centuries of history and also across multiple different industries. And actually, a lot of those companies were non-digital at core. That experience is worth something. Some of the products I've worked on have been used and seen by millions and millions of people. I've saved businesses from multi-million pound mistakes with some product-led thinking. I've helped large and complex businesses to rapidly test and scale new ideas from inside a waterfall culture. So yeah. I'm now happily back in the world of large, sometimes complex organizations and working for the AA, and I'm happy about it because I've recognized that startups, disruption, and agile, they're not the only thing that makes a good product person. You may be wondering this evening, why, why would I ever want to work for a large enterprise? Or you might be in one like me, and you might be struggling with managing the different types of complexity that can feel like they're distracting you from being that real product person. Well, what I'm going to speak to you may give you a new idea for a slightly different career direction, if you like the sound of the challenges I'm talking about. Or maybe you'll hear something that will help you better deal with the complexity that you're facing right now. I'll share some examples of complexities, how I've dealt with them, and three learnings that really helped me. First off, the one that we all talk about, Agile. Oh, by the way, there's no need to screen grab any slides. That There's nothing useful on them. Maybe the last one, but my, my usual style is actually sitting here with this microphone recording my podcast remotely with two other blokes, and rather than delivering slides to camera. So the slides are a bit light on content, but Agile. So don't get me wrong, it's great. But also, it's great to understand that it's not the only way. In a complex business, you can pretty much guarantee that waterfall will be lurking somewhere, maybe not by name, but definitely by behavior and culture. But it's important to build your knowledge and awareness on multiple delivery models rather than just one. To give you an example of where Agile really didn't work for me, uh, I worked at British Gas a number of years ago, and you can probably imagine the complexity inside a large energy supplier. One of my tasks was to ensure that the digital sales channels conformed with some new regulatory requirements for selling energy tariffs, 
it was a huge change for the business impact in finance, billing, pricing, sales, marketing, product portfolios, the lot. And there was a deadline. When a government regulator tells you there's a deadline, as a product manager, you don't go back to Ofgem and say, yeah, that's great, but, but let's not focus on the date. It's going to be ready when it's ready. Just let us do some discovery, build an MVP, and really try to understand the problems our customers have first. We'll probably need about four sprints, but, but we're not sure yet. No, no, no. Your number one outcome is to be compliant by that deadline. And you use whatever process or methodology that best suits your team to do it, even if you need to make one up. But that's OK. New guidelines from a regulator can often take years for an industry to prepare for and yet still be open to interpretation weeks before a deadline. We had to engage with the legal teams to somehow try and distill the reams of technical legal documentation into something consumers could still use while minimizing the impact on conversion. We had to work with our UX team to cope with new pricing comparison formats mandated by law. Yet there were formats that consumers had never seen before. And by the way, we couldn't A-B test before the deadline because well, you can't sell something online that your billing and pricing systems couldn't yet support. And in a price sensitive market like that, your senior stakeholders won't entertain you going early to test the impact and make adjustments ahead of time. We literally had one shot to get it right at scale. Combine all this with multiple legacy systems needing updating, thousands of call center agents to train, a fixed point in time to do it all by, Waterfall kind of becomes a bit of a friend. You can't get stuck on making sure your teams are working to a particular methodology. You just need to get the deliverables there on time. You can't create the perfect user experience through research, insight, and testing. You have to rely on the skills that your team has, the information you know at the time, and reduce the risk of impact just as much as you can. There isn't really a, we'll fix this in the next sprint option. Then on another project at British Gas, I was working on an even more complex product that used millions of gas and electricity data points that were coming in from our smart meters. Uh, we wanted to improve energy usage insights for about 8 million customers. Uh, this was being built and delivered by the Connected Homes team. Um, and they're better known for building the Hive smart thermostat, which you've probably heard of. And yeah, that's a definitely a disruptive product. But the product development was financed by British Gas themselves. So where your delivery team was totally product-led, agile, all that great stuff, the polar opposite to who was actually paying for the work. So with a complex product and an even more complex political situation, as a product person, I had to really focus on moving the cross-departmental conversations towards focusing on the progress we were making with delivery and the improvements being made for both customers and businesses without getting too distracted by the clash of methodologies and how we were paying for it. So in roles like this, you end up doing a lot of problem solving, but it's not end customer problems. It's sometimes internal customer problems. How do I get through the next stage gate to ensure we have funding when the team delivering the product doesn't estimate or forecast further ahead than the next sprint? How do I time product releases to millions of customers so I don't have thousands of angry call center agents to deal with? Don't lose hope. You can, you know, you can use a what needs to be true questioning approach to work backwards and find a way forwards. And to talk about those giant call centers, the agents won't forgive you if you keep making product increments and improvements every single week without telling them. But they'll love you if you explain why you want to do that and get them involved in helping. And with high traffic volume digital products, you, you can learn really, really quickly. The flip side of that is that mistakes can be really, really expensive. So your focus sometimes has to move away from your team and towards tackling organizational problem solving. You may not be able to use Agile in full all of the time, but that doesn't stop you using what you know about it to help a more traditional business reach better outcomes. It's not an all or nothing thing. So actually, just, just to pause for a moment to tell a quick story to illustrate this, during, during lockdown earlier on, uh, my wife was suddenly forced to work at home too. She's not in product management. She, she's an accountant. She runs a team of finance professionals. We were talking one morning and she was saying how she was struggling to keep her team focused and communicating in the first few weeks of lockdown as they all, all got used to it, which you can understand. Um, so I, I, I said to her, well, how about starting a daily stand-up and use some of the things that I use with the tech teams that I work with, you know, the standards, what did I do yesterday? What am I doing today? Blockers, two-minute max, no questions. You know that you know you know what it is. 
it actually it worked a treat and they're still doing it now so think about that if if a team of accountants can take a single agile ceremony it's just a small part of agile and integrate it into their daily work and see an impact then you as a product person you should definitely be able to even bring just that into into a waterfall business Remember though, it's just a theory. We all talk about focusing on outcomes, not outputs, but when the desired outcome is binary, in my case, it was deciding it was either meeting the industry regulations or risking huge fines and a loss of a license. How you get there becomes less important. I've also found that when you work on complex products, particularly when it's in a large complex organization, it can be really easy to lose yourself in the detail and become the subject matter expert because you don't want to be that product owner who wasn't detailed enough and messed things up. There can be, I guess, a real cultural element behind this, though. A business with practices and processes driven by huge requirement gathering exercises, complex sign-off processes, and funding complexities mean that you can very easily get swallowed into the detail and lose sight of shortcuts or simple solutions that can deliver value really quickly. And what business doesn't want those, waterfall or not? I worked for Travelod recently. We were experiencing site login usability issues. There were recognized problems that were getting worse and without going into details, a budget was approved for the financial year to rework a large part of the website and to tackle this as part of it. So giant hotel chains have tech stacks that are usually based on one of a handful of property management systems. And unsurprisingly, these hotel chains are mostly concerned about the physical experience of being in one of their hotels. That's what the customers care about. So that's where the business focuses, operations. A hotel chain's rooms are advertised and sold in multiple places around the internet. So two customers arriving at the same hotel on the same night in the same type of room could have paid very different prices on very different websites or maybe not even use the website to book it themselves. So yes, the hotel chain's own website and digital services are important, but it's not their focus. Filling their rooms at the best price they can is most important as is running the hundreds of buildings smoothly, safely, and efficiently at scale. And that is why, people of Product Tank, it's almost impossible to find a good hotel website. Now, there's something that those of you who have experience in disrupting things can have for free and go and disrupt. Anyway, as, as, the way, as is the way in large hotel chain, we spent hours in workshops planning the underlying changes required in legacy and not so legacy systems. We wrote documents and documents of business requirements we created UX mockups to match them, listed lines and lines of NFRs, and based almost all of it on internal knowledge about how we should fix the problems. We didn't consider what we could do cheaply and quickly to learn more about the root cause and maybe fix things faster. I hold my hands up here, this was me. I, I got so involved in following an approach that just used the incumbent process that I didn't challenge or take my head out of the detail to see if there was something simpler. But a few conversations with my manager and the UX team and it hit me. What we did have to hand was an awesome A-B testing platform. And by dusting off some old coding skills, we were able to put into production a few experiments to try to make things better for our users. And they worked. They worked at least six months ahead of when the project was due to deliver the benefit. I'm not for a moment suggesting that you use an A-B tool to patch up broken parts of your website. But always be aware that the detail and the culture can sometimes make you blind to obvious, simpler solutions. You may need to play the longer game to deliver large scale change in an enterprise architecture environment. But if you can tool up the systems that give you a parallel channel, you can use some of that agile thinking we spoke about earlier alongside a more traditional delivery model. And if you fear that you're becoming consumed in the details, work out who in the business is far enough away from what you're doing that could be used as a sounding board. Someone you can trust to give you a different perspective and help you see the simplicity of a situation. As I mentioned, the team culture can play a massive part in this. To use the famous, we need teams of missionaries, not teams of mercenaries quote, it can be easy to get forced into the detail and complexity if your delivery team is more on the mercenary side, as they may not give you the pushback on you need or expect. They may not challenge you to be less complex, and on the rare occasion, it may be in their interest to build in complexity. An observation I've made over the years is that if you're not being regularly challenged by your delivery team, your scrum master, or your engineering team, then it's usually not actually a sign that you're an amazing product owner who gets it right all of the time. 
it's more than likely that they're not as invested in what they're building as they should be, and you're not having to get involved and having to get detailed. So it's so detailed that you risk losing sight of the simplicity and the elegance that you should be pushing for as a team. So embrace the pain of being challenged. It's a sign that you will be on a path to a better result. Finally, if you're not as old as me, or you don't connect with the cultural reference to this guy, well, this is Columbo. Columbo is or was a 1970s American TV detective. What made this show interesting is that at the start of each episode, you as the viewer knew who the culprit was. You saw who committed the murder as the opening scene. And then you watched Columbo unravel each mystery by working through the contradictions between truth and versions of the truth that are presented to him by the killer. More about him in a second. Trying to think like Columbo has sometimes helped me in navigating complex situations in complex businesses over the years, and the skill set and techniques he uses to draw fascinating parallels to the thinking skills or mindsets you need in the world of complex product management. Now, I knew I wanted to talk about Columbo tonight, but I couldn't work out how. I don't have the time to show you a whole episode, but I have recently found a new book, and it relates this very closely to this idea by describing four different mindsets that I, th I think and the author thinks are key to being a successful and influential product person. The analyst, the explorer, the challenger, and the evangelist mindset. In each episode of Columbo, you'll see him take on each of these mindsets as he gets to work, gradually narrowing in on a decision. The book, which this slide is taken from, is quite new, I think December last year, and it's called The Influential Product Manager, How to Lead and Launch Successful Technology, and it's by Ken Sandy. It covers these mindsets in detail, and I really recommend it as a great read if you want to learn more about this, but I'll give you a quick overview. And if you know Columbo, try to imagine him in an episode as I read from the book. The Explorer Mindset. You must be ready to imagine the possibilities and brainstorm the options. The Evangelist Mindset. Yet you must know when to focus and to motivate a team toward a singular goal. It's a bit like exploring all the potential scenarios before choosing a suspect to go after. And then you've got the Analyst Mindset. You must gather data to discover hidden gems. The Challenger Mindset. But you must ask the hard questions to eliminate the less promising paths. So it's really important to change your mindset frequently, particularly if you know your natural state matches one of these. This is how Columbo uses his interrogation style to get valuable clues from people, sometimes without them realizing, and sometimes by forcing their hand, by saving the hardest questions to last, or by making his killer statement just as he leaves a room, just one more thing. I've learned on complex products where your work can have ramifications across multiple departments. You can reduce the pressure on yourself and improve your decision-making by thinking like Columbo with the use of those multiple mindsets. So work hard to assimilate as much wide information and understanding as possible up front. Identify those possible contradictions early so you can make solid judgments on whether a decision really is important or not and how it might relate to longer-term outcomes. And so in summary, my final slide. How do I deliver digital products in complex non-digital organizations? Well, I understand the theories, but actually I stay really flexible when it comes to their usage. I remind myself about simplicity frequently. And if I get stuck, I ask myself, what would Colombo do? Thank you. I love it. That's brilliant, Keith. Uh, thank you for, for that talk. Um, a few kids highlights from me. I, I loved your point about you know, agile isn't the only answer, um, and specifically that point about, you know, sometimes you have to work backwards in order to work mm. forwards. So try and start with the outcome in mind and then work out what you need to do in order to get there. Um, and you've given us a whole new product methodology around uh, thinking like Columbo. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, a brilliant comment as well. Uh, thank you for everybody who submitted their comments and questions. A brilliant comment there from uh, Caroline. Uh, she completely agrees with you, Keith, around, you know, wa waterfall seems to be a dirty word now, uh, but actually it definitely does have its place, especially when you are managing large risk products like the ones that you talked about. So that's definitely resonating with a lot of people. So yeah, please do keep the comments and questions coming. But thank you, Keith. That was a, a brilliant talk, really um, insightful. Um, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, keep your questions coming for Keith. We'll have more time to, to grill him at the end in our Q&A session. Um, but next up, we've got um, Emily. 
So um, moving on to look at new technologies. And um, so when you look at things like um, AI, they have the potential to transform into some amazing customer experiences. But equally, they do have the possibility they could actually just make things a lot more complicated and than they already are. Um, I've seen Emily talk before, um, and she is brilliant. Sorry, Emily, extra pressure. Um, but um, she's a true expert in terms of how do you integrate AI into products uh, for the better. Um, so she's going to share with us some of her experiences about how do you make those AI uh, experiences feel more human rather than making things uh, unnecessarily complicated. And as I alluded to earlier, Emily's got a brilliant breadth of experience across companies, uh, startup, scale up and corporate, including brands like uh, Babylon and Microsoft. So she's got lots of experiences uh, in this space that she can share with us. Um, so, yeah, uh, over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Caroline. OK, so let's just imagine that you hadn't heard that lovely introduction about me. And I'm going to start with a little bit of an experiment that is easier when we're in a big crowd. But let's pretend that I were at a big conference stage and walked out on stage and said, hi, everyone, I'm intelligent. Now, I think hopefully if you're watching at home, this made you pivot and sort of spit out your drink and go, what is going on with this talk? The reason I say that is because the word intelligent is incredibly loaded. So what we're talking about tonight when we talk about designing for AI and creating products and in artificial intelligence is really all about setting user expectations because the term intelligence is so loaded. As product owners, we need to be aware of this and create minimum viable intelligence when we need to. We're going to fly through this in 20 minutes, so I hope everybody's paying attention. I also will make one note. I broke my hand recently, so, so apologies if you see me talking with my hands. This is not a fashion statement. All right, we'll jump right in. First, as was already shared about me, my background is working at various different organizations. And the reason I mention these is that they are all different scales of artificial intelligence. So when I speak with experience about working at Microsoft and working at Babylon Health, the lessons are the same for AI. It comes down to the same principles. And that's what I'm going to share with you all today. Now, let's just face it. The, the complexity has been attached to AI. And more and more, it's become a buzzword in our space. And that's why a lot of people are interested in working on it. The problem is that buzzwords are loaded. What often happens is I'll be working in the tech industry here in London. And people come up to me and say, hey, how can we do an AI at our company if they're founders, let's say? Or they'll say, you know, our company really start needs to start doing AI as if it's just a box that you tick. People forget that AI is a tool, it's a means to an end, and that it's not just something you do. The thing is that often people are thinking of this. They're thinking of the data science, the algorithms, the rules that goes into making good machine learning and artificial intelligence products. But there's so much more that goes into that from a user perspective. And coming from a background in design, that's been my bias that's led me to product. It's important for me to make sure that we're bringing users along for the ride and not just thinking of the tech that builds the experience. So for the purposes of these next few minutes, when we talk about artificial intelligence, I'm going to put the tech aside for a moment and let us define it by this definition. What I particularly want to double click on is this last sentence, that AI is about the broader concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in a way we would consider smart. Because when it comes to complexity, it helps to deduce and simplify things. And that's what we're going to do in this talk about AI, is simplify the complexity so that you all know where you would start on an AI product. Now, when it comes to my own practice working in product and design and technology, I love to be inspired by human intelligence. My background is in psychology, so I love to lean on humans to inspire my designs and my products from there on out. And so therefore, if I'm working in artificial intelligence, I think it makes sense to start by asking ourselves the question, well, what makes someone or something smart? So what I've done is I've broken down how we perceive other humans as intelligent, as well as how we perceive technology as intelligent. And what I notice is we go through the same sorts of evaluating criteria for both. I'll walk through each of these three phases bit by bit as we do this talk right now. The first off is going to seem dead simple, and that's just, is it alive and responsive? As humans, we do this without even realizing. I'll give you an example. Anybody here who has children on the call knows what it's like to take them to the beach or take them into nature and they find something and wonder, is it alive? Is it going to respond to me? And so you might have seen them pick up a stick or do something to get a response out of it, to get a reaction. If you've seen a jellyfish, they're poking it to tell if it's still alive. The reason we do this is we first need to establish responsiveness to figure out how further we can interact with it. It's the reason 
reason you may not ask someone directions if um, they're taking a nap on the train. You're not going to interrupt them if they're not actively able to converse with you. And the same goes for technology. You may be wondering what the connection to AI is here. But herein, this principle lies the most important part of people working in AI, product works, et cetera, to remember front end intelligence. And the number of startups I've seen that invest in data science and back end work, but the front end doesn't work, means that if your app isn't even responsive, if it doesn't open, if there's a slow load time or it hits an error and lags and gets stuck, well, users are never gonna see the actual intelligence right? You have to respond to that first click, that first swipe, that first interaction has to be smooth and crisp. Otherwise, users won't assume that the product or service is alive, awake, or alert, and able to work out for their needs. So that's the first column that you need to hit. It needs to be responsive. And it's important to note it because people often brush those details under the rug and they think of the bigger picture of these algorithms. But we're not done yet with evaluating competence because the next thing that people look for isn't just, is it alert? Is it gonna to respond to me? But can I trust it? Is it competent when it comes to tech? Can it achieve the basic tasks that I set out for it to do? And there's lots of different ways we do this. With looking at humans again for our inspiration, the same way I did before, let's think about humans in the sense of how we judge each other's competence. There was a university study where university students were broken into two groups. One group of students was going to evaluate the GPA or the grade point average of their peers. They were going to watch videos of the other group who was going to basically respond to questions and hold an interview about their career aspirations. Now the folks who were interviewed on camera would often speak in engaging ways about what they hope to do, but they were never actually speaking about their grades they earned. And those evaluating would watch and notice details like, were they maintaining eye contact and engaged with the interviewer or were they looking up or over at the walls and not really paying attention? What became the deciding criteria for how students perceived their peers as intelligent or not had to do with that one small detail, with eye contact. On average, students ranked their peers as having lower GPAs when they didn't engage in active eye contact in these interviews. Now that was actually not at all correlated with their GPAs or grades whatsoever, but it was an interesting deduction that their peers decided these individuals were less competent just based on that one small detail. And I mention it because it's yet another reminder for all of us to get the details right when it comes to our users evaluating us. So for one of the companies I worked with, there was this principle of a 10 to win uh, that we discovered based on the fact that our, our tools worked on different websites. And if users visited 10 different websites, within the first 10 that they visited, if we hit any errors or had any problems, they were less likely to work with us again. That was the same as our product losing eye contact and drifting away a little bit. So the reason I say it is because it's important to think about the first impressions you're making with your users and thus the performance and the quality that you're going to hit in your first few interactions or whatever it may be for your product. It's important to think about what is our moment of eye contact? What's that detail for us that we need to hit in order to make our users trust us to be competent enough to do the different tasks that we say we can. Now, I'm going to go through each of these sections, but you may think so far, We've only spoken about testing your product or users being skeptical of it, and that's important. Their skepticism can both work to your advantage and disadvantage. On the plus side, you may actually engage users in this phase. This may be something that you'll see. For example, I would interview users that had used the first generations of Siri, and years later they were skeptical, but we were able to engage them and show them that we beat their expectations that were quite low and quite poor. And so that was a great way to take their skepticism in evaluating and testing our software and turn it on them and show them that it actually can beat their expectations. Now, the downside of these first two phases of people interacting with and trying out your product is that it's also when they can lose faith in your higher aims. I say this because I've seen countless times where users will say, try to ask the weather, of a voice assistant, or they may try to set a reminder. And if any of those interactions fail, those users are less likely to then say, trust the same voice assistant to order a pizza with their credit card. And it's just common sense. But it's because of this that these first two evaluating criteria columns are so critical to get right when it comes to making sure users get the experience that they feel they're bargained for, thus in using artificial intelligence. Now, the reason I say this is because we don't need to just 
assume that setting expectations is an important thing to do. We see what happens when we don't set user expectations correctly. I use the Fire Festival example because if anybody's seen the Netflix documentary, you know what can happen when you promise one thing to users or to customers and you don't deliver. Now, this may not happen for tech companies very often that they've got documentaries made about them on Netflix, et cetera, but it's worth thinking about what this impact could be for your company. Setting user expectations and promising them a five-star getaway and giving them tents may result in a documentary for some companies, but in tech, in our world, it results in users uninstalling your app or giving it poor ratings in the app store. So what happens when you set expectations too high is it ends up hurting you. And so that's why when I advise companies and any product owner, I very much encourage them to take a crawl, walk, run approach, especially when it comes to complex projects like artificial intelligence. It's such a big field to tackle. You want to make sure that you set expectations all along the way. With your users, you want to be very clear of where you are, that you can't say run to 5K yet, you're still in crawl mode. Because too often startups tend to think in the run mode, which is exactly where they should be for venture capitalists, members of their board, et cetera, as they sell their vision for the company. But they need to remind users when they're still in beta or alpha. And it's important to thus check in with your product teams and your design teams to make sure you're being honest about the way the tech is going to present and perform for your users. We've experienced this in lots of different ways at the companies I've worked at. This is actually old UI. The Babylon app, though looks like a text messaging service, makes sure that it sets expectations with users. These are two different times in the same experience that it interrupts them to tell them, no, I'm not a doctor. This may look like text messaging, but it doesn't replace a doctor. And it's important to do that, to let users know what they can expect from your service. Now, I know this from personal experience as well. When we launched the first version of Cortana, we put in the taskbar, ask me anything. And if you've been paying attention so far in this talk, you know this goes against what I've been saying about setting users' expectations. This is more of a challenge. This says, go on, challenge me and ask me anything. And users did. And now the design and, and articulation of Cortana is quite different. And that makes sense because users did meet that challenge. And it's something that taught us all a lot of behavior about users when it comes to artificial intelligence. Now, this may seem a bit doom and gloom because so far I've been speaking a lot about how companies need to lower expectations, need to adjust when it comes to AI and not promise the world. And that's true, but it's also a source of inspiration. And so I wanted to use Context Scout as an example for that. Now, if anybody wants just a really five second crash course in knowledge graphs, knowledge graphs look a bit like this and they relate to clustering information and relationships between information. The only reason you need to know that is because it starts to explain the architecture of the way some of these things work. The reason I explain it is because we actually base some of our design for these targets based on the way knowledge graphs work because there were times that one individual's online profile would include some information and times where that same profile wouldn't. So it's important to be honest with the fact that the knowledge graph would change, which in our case, because it was web-based, it did it change based on what users put online and offline, whereas in a medical context, it didn't change as much for us at Babylon. The reason I mention that is because our design was inspired by this change. Instead of a rigid menu that would or wouldn't have information sometimes, the AI, as it found and discovered things through its web-based knowledge graph, would pop forward categories, as you just saw in the animation here, giving users a really delightful lens on intelligence. Instead of finding things or not, it was a bubbly and fun suggestion that the interface gave them, rather than a, a sort of reflection of the fact that the knowledge graph could change. This is the way that if you bring design and product and technology together to talk about what the tech can do, and also really importantly, what it can't do, that's how you can create great solutions for your users that are honest about what AI or machine learning is capable of. Right, so we have still just covered the first two, dealing with responsiveness and competence, but they're such key critical moments because before something can be impressive and delight your users, you have to be able to do those first two columns. So now let's talk about artificial intelligence and delight. First though, because we're all about simplifying complexity tonight, I wanna to break down, going back to that definition of users' perceptions of tech being smart. Let's think about two different ways to break down artificial intelligence. There's AI that imitates human behavior. This might be Alexa telling a joke that you find funny, could be a humanoid robot that scares you a little bit, or it could just be small, tiny details in the design, such as Google's Duplo going, mm -hmm, that confirm an imitation of human behavior, be it through style, comedy, et cetera. 
And then there's providing unique value as another lens for artificial intelligence. Both of these things are AI just in different ways. So this might be Watson scheduling uh, and health tooling, for example, or the way Google can respond uh, quick replies in your emails, or even just saving time and tasks. This was something we did to save the way people viewed information. These are things that provide value. And I'm going to lean into that second definition of AI for a moment, because I bet most of you probably would be interested in working in that space. It's important to remember that it can be AI and still not present as a humanoid robot. The reason is that human winning moments can be big and small. So for example, the screen that you're seeing on the right hand side might look like a small screen, just a basic UI, but this is the outcome of an AI symptom checker. And so for me, having gotten that screen, I actually did have tonsillitis and that was a really magical moment that it confirmed what my doctor suspected. So that's a magical moment that may not always present as AI, but as long as you understand to your users where the value is, then you can deliver a valuable design. Mentioning users, we saw at another company where we were doing recruitment tooling, we saw lots of users drawing bar graphs of how long people worked at different places. So therefore we decided to bring that into our service and the AI could accomplish that visualization within a couple seconds if even, and employees were able to say, wow, you actually saved me time. So remember that the magic and the intelligence is in the eyes of your users, not necessarily those of you who work at the company, because it'll be impressive and sometimes surprising to you what moments they latch onto. But they're the ones who are going to be using your products and your services. So you are designing and creating products for them. So I want to be able to leave you all today with how can you handle if someone comes to you and says, hey, how do we do AI or we need to start doing AI on our business? So this is how I would arm you all for it. First, for large or small companies, it's important to set expectations appropriately. Know that if you're claiming intelligence, you're going to need to go above and beyond user expectations. And what that means is doing a few things very well. Often, that means for startups, getting scenario focused, being quite precise about what you are trying to accomplish. Use voice, for example, when it comes to different AI devices, voice is very popular but only use it if your scenario, devices, and environment all support it because it requires a lot of things to go right. And personify only if it's helpful. For example, at Babylon, this is something that we've gone back and forth on because we'd be gathering users' information. Do we want that to have a fun and zippy personality or not? These are important product decisions because that first impression of your artificial intelligence app or platform is gonna be very important to users. Lastly, it also means that sometimes you need to build rails into your experience. So if your service is not ready to support full natural language and dialogue, you can use multiple choice instead to keep users on track. We've done that and this is a mock-up to show users that sometimes if we can't quite parse or understand what a user is asking for, we can give them chips and options to guide them, to keep them back in the path. And also it's important to remember with artificial intelligence, don't be this guy. Make sure your AI is intelligent in terms of being informative and helping users. If anybody's a Parks and Recs fan, I hope they get the reference. But it's not the persona that you want to paint for your artificial intelligence. You want it to be assistive. The reason I say that is that good intelligence makes users feel smart and competent. It saves them time and effort, and it lets them use their brains for what they do best. It automates the boring parts of their job. Bad intelligence, and I, you know, it seems silly we have to say this, but these are principles that we should apply in this industry, makes users feel stupid. It doesn't empower them. It doesn't use language that supports them, but it also doesn't save any time. It might be full of gimmicks and different tricks, but it might not actually automate anything to make their jobs or their lives easier. It's important also to remember that when we build an interface using natural language, especially that often users' expectations, just like at the beginning of this talk when I spoke about expectations being so big for AI, they will almost always be bigger than what you and your product team have planned for your chatbot or your artificial intelligence agent to answer. So the job of setting expectations is exactly about outlining this fence that you see on the screen, showing users what they can and can't say, what they can and can't expect, what they should be giving to the agent or the chatbot in order to get certain outcomes back. It's a hard job of constantly drawing that fence for them because users have this optimism that they can speak naturally. But it's something that you, you and your product owners should continue to do. And we can talk about tips for that over time in the Q&A. Lastly, it's important to remember to have fun. Because we've talked so much tonight about how important it is to know that users are going to test your product, don't just think of it in a doom and gloom way, but have a little bit of fun with it. 
knowing users are going to push the buttons of AI means that you can show them you're in on the joke. So for example, what I've got on the screen here is what we would say to people if someone asked Cortana, will you be my girlfriend? It's fun to show them that you're in on the joke and you've got a cheeky joke to give back to that kind of thing. Or we also adjusted per market. So what would you do for Diwali? And Cortana shows that she knows the region is going to make a local joke about this Indian holiday. It's a way to show users that you're in on the intelligence. You're not just alert. You're not just paying attention and competent, but you're smart enough to know that they're looking for you to fall. So in closing, minimum viable intelligence does a few things very well. Don't expect to be intelligent before you're smart. Under promise and over deliver always and surprise users with intelligence that suits your scenario and lets them know your flavor of intelligence. That's my time. Thanks everybody for listening to Designing for AI. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you for condensing that into 20 minutes, very rapid 20 minutes, but thank you very yeah. much. I love the way um, you share really sort of uh, real examples of companies that, you know, ask me anything challenge from Cantana, I think is a really interesting one, as well as yeah, looking for those little moments when you really can uh, delight your users. Uh, thank you ever so much for that talk, some really good takeaways uh, for everybody there. Um, and please, in the comments, please do post if you've got any specific questions uh, for Emily for the, the Q&A at the end of this session. So thank Thank you very much. So next up, uh, we've got Matthew. Um, so Matthew is the uh, head of product at Ocado Technology. Um, and Matthew knows a thing or two about uh, complex products. Um, and I know this just from the, <laughs> the work that he does at Ocado. So Ocado are developing the world's most advanced automated grocery fulfillment uh, centers, which includes robotics, IoT, and advanced algorithmic software and more. So that definitely sounds like a, a complex uh, product to manage. And Matthew's going to talk us through his five tips for how to structure and organize your teams around developing uh, complex products. So again, please do keep adding your um, comments and questions because we will go straight on to Q&A after this session. But over to you, Matthew. Thanks a lot, Caroline. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Caroline said, I'm going to be sharing with you my five tips for how uh, I think you can help organize your teams if you're having to develop uh, complex products. So as Caroline said, uh, I'm a head of product. Uh, I'm currently working at Ocado Technology. And at Ocado Technology, we think we're transforming online grocery through cutting edge technology and serial innovation. So if you're based in London or the UK in the audience, you may be familiar with Ocado.com. That's the uh, online only grocer here in the UK. And Ocado Technology is the technology business kind of that powers uh, and develops all of the software and technology that powers Ocado.com. But we're also using that technology to power many other retailers around the world and help take their uh, grocery business online. So what we offer to those uh, international grocery retailers is what we call the Ocado Smart Platform. Uh, and it's a, an end-to-end -end online grocery platform, like I said, for those grocery businesses to take their uh, business online and start taking orders online. And we, uh, so we offer a, a complete end-to-end -end platform. So that, that includes web shop and mobile apps. It includes automated fulfillment centers. It includes store picking solutions, solutions for routing vans uh, and supply chain systems. And there are complex products in, in all of these domains. My experience at Ocado has been in the development of our, our robotic solutions within our automated warehouses. And it's from that experience as a head of product that I've kind of gathered what I think are five good tips for, for how you organize around developing complex products. But before I get into my five tips, I do like to show some videos. It's, uh, I find a lot of people are very familiar with uh, e-commerce, mobile apps, you use them every day uh, kind of in your life, but not everyone is necessarily familiar with the sorts of robotic solutions we're developing. So hopefully these videos will, will come across okay uh, on the live stream. So this is one of our automated fulfillment centers, uh, and this is called The Hive. Uh, and everything you can see in this video is developed by Ocado. The physical robots that are uh, running on the grid, the grid, the structure that they're running on, we develop inside the software on the robots, the chargers, basically everything you can see. And there's also things you can't see in this video that we develop, a proprietary wireless network, 
uh, an air traffic control like software control system which orchestrates the entire system uh, there are GUIs and user interfaces for our engineers to keep the system running and maintain and diagnose any errors and this, I can tell you, is, is a truly complex system. Um, so that we, we call this robotics, but maybe I think when, when I say robotics, this is maybe an example that people might come to more readily come to mind. So this is another robotics-based system that we're delivering here, and this is uh, our robotic pick system. So this is robotically picking items into our customer orders. Uh, and we have a couple of these live in one of our warehouses in the UK already. And I, I'm super fortunate. I, I get to work on this stuff every day. Uh, this is the, the bread and butter of my job. Uh, and, it, and it's really exciting. So like I said, these are, are complex systems. They, they're digital systems. They exist in the physical world. They are manipulating the physical world. Uh, and when you're organizing your teams to try and develop these products, you need you need to do so in a certain way if you're going to be successful so yeah let me get on to my top five tips then so tip number one is provide autonomy now i put this as my first tip because i think autonomy is is crucial to everything and it and it's sort of fundamental to how we set ourselves up at Hercado technology uh, and we apply it a lot when we come to think about how we should split up and organize the organization. And there are two main things we think about when we are thinking about providing autonomy. One is that every, every time we split the organization, whether it be at the top level or down to a, a product team, we give each team or group in the split a clear mission or a part of the platform or a product for which they are solely responsible. So they can, they are autonomous in delivering their part of the platform. But it's also about making sure that uh, they are also able to deliver uh, their part, their, their goals, their ambitions and aims for their part of their products. That means they have the knowledge, the tools, and the skills uh, to, to successfully deliver, deliver their part of the, the platform. And by putting autonomy front and center, front and center, we help minimize dependencies between our teams and between different parts of the organizations. This enables us to move fast and it enables us to respond quickly in an ever-changing environment. And it also enables us to evolve the whole platform in parallel. Like I said at the beginning, we're um, developing an end-to-end -end platform. So we want to be able to push on our, our e-commerce and our mobile solutions, obviously in parallel while we're developing our supply chain systems uh, along with our, our warehouses and kind of move all these parts of the platform all at the same time. And so what does this look like in practice? So in my experience, this often leads to what I call kind of vertical or domain orientated organizations uh, and where your teams are often kind of cross-functional or, or multidisciplinary. And so in, in a normal setting, when you talk about cross-functional teams, maybe that means having some design, some products, some engineering, maybe a subject matter expert, maybe some say uh, legal or accounting if you're in those sorts of domains. But in the space of robotics, it gets even more complicated. It often means you also need on top of those, you might need some ML engineers, some simulation specialists, robotics researchers, mechanical, electrical engineers, on top of the UX and uh, front end teams that you might also need. And so yeah, yeah so provide autonomy, I think it's really important. So if you take that tip and you're willing and you have the intention to provide autonomy and you're thinking about splitting up your organization, kind of what do you what do you do? And so my second tip is to embrace Conway's law. I found in my experience that deciding how to split up your product and how to form your teams and, and who should be responsible for which parts is probably one of been the hardest parts of my job as a head of product. But knowing Conway's law and trying to use it to my advantage has always helped me. Now, if you're not familiar with Conway's law, yeah, I'm gonna paraphrase and it states that if you're an organization designing a system, then you will design it to mirror your organization's communication structure. And so you can approach this in one of two ways. You can design your organization and get your desired organizational structure and then Conway's law will imply that your your kind of your system architecture will fall out from that 
uh, organizational that uh, organizational design. But more favorably, what you can do is you can you can take this in reverse and use it to your own advantage. You can design your organization to actually promote uh, the desired system architecture that you wish. And only recently did I find that that approach actually has a name. Uh, uh, it's called the inverse Conway mover, and I, that comes from a book called Team Topologies, which I would uh, highly recommend reading. And if you take your the approach of providing autonomy and you you follow this, what what I found it means is that often what you want at the boundary of your teams is well-defined and stable interfaces or APIs. Uh, and so if you have those existing APIs already, they can provide natural points at which you can look at uh, splitting up your teams. And if you don't have those, you sometimes have to work to think about how you might introduce them to, to enable teams to uh, have their autonomy. I think Amazon are, uh, are probably the most well-known example of communication through APIs and the, and the edict, which almost as, as kind of urban legend goes, that came down from Jeff Bezos to, for teams to only communicate through APIs. And, and I think that's really powerful because it allows the, the whole business to continue to go fast. Uh, and so kind of using a, a simple example to highlight what this may look like, and I'll, I'll use a physical example rather than a digital example. As you saw from the video, we have, we have robots there. They run in two directions on the top of what we call a grid. Now the track and the wheels, they perform two sides of quite a well-defined and stable interface. The teams that are developing the robots, as long as they keep the same wheels with the same diameter, width, tire material, they can change the robot pretty much however they want uh, and be confident they will continue to run uh, on, on the grid and the track. And similarly, the teams who are developing the mechanical structure on which the robots run on, well, as long as they keep the track dimensions the same and maintain their side of the interface, they can design their grid and make whatever changes they need completely independently. So this may sound obvious, but I think it's worth stating that actually sometimes you can see find organizations that, that aren't split vertically or split in this kind of domain orientated way and maybe are split by technical discipline. Uh, so sometimes maybe split by craft, say by mechanical engineers or electrical engineers. And I often find that introduces, if you split that way, to too many dependencies and, and often provides unnecessary dependencies which slow you down. So if you're providing autonomy and you've split your organization up by uh, using Conway's law, how do you make sure that you're teams are aligned and all pulling in the same direction. So my third tip is that you need to align your teams with strategy and KPIs. So in the, in the absence of this direction, a risk with providing autonomy is that teams decide to take their products in opposing directions and actually not work together to provide benefit to your business. Now, if you're in a company where your teams are working on distinct business models or distinct products, that may be okay. But in, in the case of my current uh, example in, in our warehouse, we've got over a thousand people, probably in over a hundred teams, working to develop different parts of our warehouse solution. And this is a highly coupled, highly complex system. So if those hundred teams aren't all working towards the same goals, the same strategy, the same KPIs, we're, we're never going to make any, uh, any real progress. So I think you, you hear a lot in, in product theory uh, about why kind of product strategy and KPIs is important. But I think in complex products and in complex organizations, it, it, the importance of it is uh, even stronger. So if I think about KPIs, I wanted to share a few uh, kind of ways of which how we subdivide our KPIs. So like we've subdivided our organization based on Conway's law, well, we, we might have some top level KPIs that are applicable to the, to the whole warehouse, but we really need to, to split them up uh, and pull out the parts of those KPIs, which each of the individual teams can own and take ownership for and, spill, and feel responsible for moving. And actually there, there are several different ways which I've found you, you can do this. Uh, one way is what I've called fractionally, so if you have a cost-based or, or a dollar-based KPI, uh, an example in, in my scenario would be 
the cost to build a warehouse, then it's really easy to identify the different line items or the different fractions which make up that cost and apportion that to the respective engineering teams. Um, and another way you may split up the KPIs is I've called by process. So uh, an example of this is we really care about obviously the consumer experience, even in the warehouse, the consumers don't necessarily know how their orders have been fulfilled, but we wanna deliver the best consumer experience and making sure our orders are delivered on time in the slot that we guaranteed to our customers is extremely important. And the delivery of an order is a whole process. It's a process from stock coming into the warehouse to the order being fulfilled, to getting it onto a van for, or onto a trailer, for that trailer to drive to a spoke, for that spoke, the trailer to be kind of unloaded and split up onto multiple vans, those vans to go on the road and actually deliver to the customer's door. And so you can split up your KPIs by, by that process. So obviously the top level KPI is, is on-time delivery, but within the warehouse, the, the only part we can control is making sure we get our orders fulfilled and out of the door of the warehouse on time. We can't control what happens on the road or on the vans, and so we don't focus on that. So that's one way of splitting your KPIs by up by what I call process. And the third way which we found of, of it could be useful to split up KPIs, especially in an environment where we have software and hardware, is splitting it up temporally, so by time frame. So if you're familiar with hardware product development, you will know that the product life cycle and the product development life cycle is often extremely longer than it is in software. So you sometimes are talking on one or two years to develop a new product or make a product iteration, as opposed to one or two weeks in, in software if you're practicing Agile uh, and say Scrum with sprints. So we can actually split up our KPIs on that time frame and look at what can the software teams do in the short in the shorter term frame to, to make uh, changes on our KPIs? And then what can our hardware teams and the teams looking after hardware products, what can they do in the longer time frame to kind of take that KPI even further in the future? So that, that's just a few examples of the way we, we split up our KPIs to, to give our teams kind of that, that autonomy and responsibility as well. So uh, if, if I recap a little, if you think now we have uh, we have autonomous teams, they're owning distinct parts of our product portfolio. They've got clear KPIs which they know how uh, com combine and contribute to the to the wider business goals. And you have said there's hundreds of teams working on many things to get uh, done at once. How do we make sure that stuff actually gets done? And so. Uh, my fourth tip for today is to appoint DRIs or directly responsible individuals. So, like I say, providing autonomy is really important for us, and it, uh, autonomy doesn't go unchecked. Autonomy has to be accompanied by accountability. And what we're trying to fight against here in appointing directly responsible individuals is the bystander effect, which, when you have, like I say, a department or the hundreds of teams, the, the bystander effect can be very strong. If you're not familiar with the bystander effect, this is a phenomenon where a person or a group is a group of people are less likely to take responsibility for something when there are lots of other bystanders or witnesses present. So the typical example is when witnessing an accident and someone having to call for a doctor or call 999. The more people there are in that situation, the more every person will individually assume that someone else will call 99, often leading to the outcome that no one calls 99 and the person doesn't get help. And so we don't want that to happen in our organization. We don't want every team to assume another team is making progress on some KPI or some, uh, some initiative or some new product development. And so we make sure we assign directly responsible individuals. And this is our kind of primary way of uh, defending against that bystander effect. So some, some of the examples of, of how this takes uh, or how this manifests is simple example. At the end of any meeting, you, you might make sure any actions have a clear owner. You make sure you have a, a single person who's responsible for any piece of development in your roadmap, whether that's a small feature spanning kind of one sprint or whether it might be kind of a multi-year project spanning tens of teams. 
uh, it's really good to have one person who feels responsible and accountable for those deliverables. And I just talked about KPIs, having your, your KPIs sort of owned by one product manager or one product team uh, can, be, can be important too. And so if we're going to appoint directly responsible individuals, and I said we're, this is, we're working in a complex system, then this leads me to my last tip, which is to promote people that, that have systems thinking. Like I said, we have a, a product in our warehouse which is highly integrated, highly complex, all parts of the system like quite coupled together to that's how we gain a lot of our performance. And so despite all of our efforts to reduce dependencies between teams, increase autonomy as much as possible, sometimes there are just things you have to develop which cut across the whole the whole warehouse or sometimes even the whole platform all the way from e maybe from e-commerce all the way down to kind of the fulfillment as part of the platform. And so if you're going to promote or appoint a directly responsible individual, uh, they need to have the bigger picture and, and be a systems thinker. And, and in case you're not aware, systems thinking is an alternative to kind of the reductionist thinking, which is also strong, is a strong kind of uh, factor in large organizations and can sometimes be actively encouraged. We, we often promote the breaking down of development into smaller chunks so that each team can just focus and work on their part. But if you kind of, there is a risk that if you uh, break the system up like that and you only have teams focusing on their individual bits, if you miss that cross uh, kind of cross looking piece, then sometimes you miss the, the core essence of why you're developing something or you miss the main objective of that large piece of work. So I've got uh, to kind of highlight how this might play out in our warehouse. I've got, got one, one more example. Two main activities in our warehouse are bringing in uh, products into the warehouse and getting them into our grid structure uh, and then picking those products into our customer orders. We have a high level uh, kind of goal within our warehouse to make the people as productive as possible. So it's very tempting to just break that down by process area and say, uh, you know, in, in the decal area, you, you go as fast as possible. And in the picking area, you go fast as possible. But sometimes how you, what you might do in these areas might uh, make each, each other area uh, counterproductive. And so if the person decanting doesn't remove all the trash from the products or remove the packaging, they may be able to go faster, but they're then hindering the person in the picking because that person who's now picking the products has to work around that trash, has to deal with it. Uh, and so. You, know, you have to see the bigger picture, understand how your, your products and your uh, processes fit into the bigger picture. And so, uh, yeah, they're my five tips. And so thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I hope you will stay safe in this, uh, in this COVID environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. That was a brilliant talk. Um, and I loved seeing the video of the little robots whizzing around because I, I, I couldn't imagine how that, that all worked. So that really helps sort of bring it to life. Um, I think it's amazing the, the efforts they've gone to at Ocado to really set up that structure across all those different autonomous teams. Uh, and then it sounds like almost them responding to some of the challenges that brings to make sure they're all aligned around sort of KPIs and taking sort of full uh, responsibility for different actions, etc. So, yeah, really, really interesting um, to hear. So thank you very much uh, for that talk. Um, brilliant. So thank you uh, for all our speakers. Thank you so much for your talks. Um, and now we're going to move on to the um, Q&A session. So. Please, for everyone watching, thank you for everyone who submitted their questions so far, but please do sort of keep them coming um, and we'll start to work through some of those questions. So um, I'll kick off. There was a really good question from um, Brian Turner uh, to start with. Uh, this one's aimed at, at you, Keith, I think, but by all means, if anyone else has got any thoughts, then please do sort of chip in. And Brian was asking, uh, when you join a new company, what's the balance between using their existing processes and trying to introduce better ways of product delivery? Um, so I don't know, Keith, if you've got any thoughts on that from the, all the different companies that you've worked in. Yeah, so I guess the first observation I've got on the question is it's going to depend on on what your role is. So if if you're a, a CPO who's been hired to do to do that job, then yeah, but you're not probably going to be worrying about the balance. So if you're if you're a product analyst going into a new team, or a product owner or a product manager, you may not be wanting to to rock that boat so so immediately, or you may not be able to. So I, I guess. To answer the question, I'd be thinking along the lines of 
taking some time to understand the business itself uh, and try and try and understand why they've got those processes as they are uh, before you make any snap decisions. And I think in doing that, you'll probably figure out what the balance is now and, and where and how far you think you can take it and what you could do. So, yeah, you ask yourself what, what's driven them to use the existing process in the first place. Mm. That's really good. Um, any other thoughts from you, um, Matthew, on that in terms of knowing when to challenge and when to accept things the way that they are? Yeah, I think in my experience, like what Keith was saying about knowing when waterfall is appropriate is really important, especially in, in the hardware world. Uh, kind of hardware development programs take a long time. And so kind of knowing when to accept that kind of that's the right process uh, and then knowing also when to, to challenge when maybe a process is taking so long or you need to kind of introduce some even some agile thinking, maybe not adopting Scrum or kind of trying to do two weekly demos or something, but taking some of the principles and challenging, I think only comes from it, from experience and exposing yourself to kind of both sides of those, uh, to, to put those both worlds really and understand how each of the, the different worlds works. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely, it makes complete sense. Um, another really good question um, from um, Bruno. It's okay, I'll, I'll start with you, Matthew, on this one and see if the others have got anything to add. But Bruno was asking, um, again, I asked you, Matthew, because you covered some of this, I think, in your talk, but how do you manage dependencies on other teams for a complex product delivery when it's hard to estimate the items and know when they will land? Yeah, I suppose part of that is, uh, I say, in maybe in your architecture. So trying to decouple as much as possible, uh, the kind of when you're splitting something up, splitting up the work so that it can be independently deployable, for example. So that, that, that can be quite, quite important knowing that, yes, one, one team's functionality may depend on another, but if you can deploy them independently and develop them independently, that kind of provides power for those teams to go on uh, kind of separately and, and together. We have a uh, our, we have a product hierarchy at Cardinal Technology. So our, our product managers report into a product hierarchy and line uh, management structure. So we often use that to kind of manage the dependencies if they are in a local area. So if two product teams in the same area depend on each other, and then we'll look to the to the kind of product line manager to to manage those dependencies or or go up. And that's another way. Uh, we can help manage the dependencies and i think my probably my last thing we would say is we rely on on project managers as well so sometimes when we have really big things which are cross uh cross what we call streams or cross large parts of the platform sometimes having having project project management come in and help manage those dependencies and the program and, and key risks and deliveries can be really important too mm, makes sense uh, anything else from you keith on that one um, yeah, I think Matthew's point about um, you know, as a product owner, working with a, a product, a project manager can sometimes be be a real lifesaver, and those two roles uh, can sometimes work really well hand in hand. So you've got mm -hmm. a product owner, you know, sort of being concerned about the, the the product itself, but a project manager trying to make things be aligned in the background, and, and that can be really important. But I think. There's probably two situations here. One is dependencies that you know about, and one's dependencies that you suddenly find out about. <laughs> and there's a big difference there. And I think that's where, you know, we're going back to good old Colombo. It's about, you know, just constantly looking out for where dependencies might be before they even happen and be trying to build your awareness as wide as you can around the business to look out for them. But then mm. if it does happen, um, communication. It, just keep talking about them, make them really visible to your team and don't try and, you know, I think, you know, you might have five or six teams all linked together. So don't try and solve it all in one go. Just try and tackle each issue as, as they come up, but, but make sure everyone's really aware of what's going on and it's mm. really visible. Makes sense. Sound advice. Um, and one for you, um, Emily, from um, Shamira. So Shamira said, a great talk, Emily. Um, how do you balance the intelligence of a product from rules-based to a fully fledged machine intelligence model. And so you're saying, I see, I've seen demand for the latter being satisfied by non-AI rules models. So yeah, great to get your thoughts on that. 
It's it's a great question. I think too often um, purists will get uh, stuck on defining what is AI, what is, what is non-deterministic AI, etc. When it comes down to it, users don't really care. Honestly, what they what they want to know is does it do what it's promised me to do? And so what I always come back to is just what are we telling users that it's capable of, and can it actually do those things? Um, so I hope I've answered your question. But at the end of the day, it, it it's it's less about what the tech is as much as just what are we promising and if that means we shouldn't call something AI, that's fine. And more and more, I think you're seeing people do this to keep things safer by saying it's an assistant, it's an agent, et cetera. So finding ways to classify things that don't get them into trouble if it isn't really going to be AI, because AI is frankly hard to do and difficult. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Not about the technology necessarily. Um, yeah. And actually, um, Emily, it'd be great if you don't mind, I'd like to sneak in a question of my own. But um, I loved in your talk, like all the different examples of sort of like, you know, uh, wow experiences, even if they you know come across as sort of fairly minor. Yes. Is there anyone that you think is leading the way in terms of really sort of delighting customers um, in this field in terms of the experience that they offer? Are there other companies that you look to and you learn from? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it completely depends. I'm, I'll, I'll give a, a large company and a small company example. So I'm, I'm impressed by the nuanced little details that Google's able to pick up. As I mentioned, the mm -hmm example in my talk, I think that's brilliant as a means to push the envelope a little bit more. And what do we classify as human behavior and what sounds, if not even words, we find are intelligent and human in their own right. That said, you can go to the other side and look at a startup. Sometimes it's about startups saying, this is our target population. This is our user group. This is our base. We're going to lean into that and show them that we know them. So Clio is one company that does this a lot in a really playful way with their chatbot. And people text and talk about it all the time about how um, engaging and interesting and exciting it is because they are leaning into a more playful way of speaking about finance. And I support that. I think that's great. Is that going to be the way that, say, Lloyd's Bank wants to go? Possibly not. <laughs> so I think it's really up to each brand to find their own way of delighting as long as it makes sense for who they are. Mm, yeah, makes sense. It means different things to different businesses depending on what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. But it's hard, though, for bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, great. It's okay. Um, so Matthew's question just come in um, for you uh, from uh, John Carmen, who says, amazing talk, Matthew. Um, I imagine you have different fulfillment centers with different generations of capabilities. How do you prioritize your product development to ensure a consistent uh, consumer experience? Yeah, so I suppose that's quite insightful. We do in the UK have uh, different generations of fulfillment centers and capabilities, but I suppose we're fortunate in that their capabilities are largely uh, largely hidden from our, our end consumers, uh, luckily. So uh, we we don't necessarily find that uh, that problem comes up as much uh, because of, like, say, we're not we're not offering a um, well, we're not offering yet different fulfillment methods for our customers. So. I suppose one way one way we one way we would do this is by being very clear again what I'm really saying about expectation. So in terms of when you when you can get an when you can get an order, can you get it uh, today? Can you get it next day, or is it not available till later? So we're able to kind of show our customers up front about here's the sort of slots you could expect based on where you live, based on what what service of uh, fulfillment center might be for fulfilling your order. And hence what capabilities it has so being very clear at the beginning you know you can get a slot tomorrow or you can get a slot today or you can get a slot in the next hour uh, so that's one way we kind of set that expectation so that our consumer experience is tied up with the different fulfillment methods that sometimes come behind it brilliant makes sense managing those expectations again <laughs> um got a question come in and um, for yourself emily uh, from hanvir so he says can you share any tips on how to scale AI-based analysis tools, such as computer vision, where the model needs training customer by customer? So this, I'm guessing that's more sort of B2B sort of examples. Yeah, that's really interesting. So training customer by customer, I'd have to look at the exact use case a little bit more, but um, anytime you want to increase your training, I would honestly just say, again, start small. So if it's about training on a data set, are you looking at, let's say it's computer vision, for example, are you focusing on just a type of vegetables rather than all foods and grocery stores, for example, let's say. I find that'll be easier for you all to manage and to look at, okay, this does fit the rules, et cetera, because there is human intervention that happens early on 
when you're trying to train these models and systems. So find easy distinctions to say what makes what fits your rules and what doesn't and just and try to start small and not try to um, have it boil the ocean and do everything but then maybe have it say okay I'm going to go with the produce example green vegetables versus other colors that's a really simple thing that you you could start to train the machine to understand before it goes into fruit or vegetable what type of vegetable etc so yeah, the, the principle stays the same, <laughs> start small. And then also if you're doing something with your users, cause I got the sense from the example that it's growing with users, ask them to help. Um, you can do this again by owning where you are in that crawl, walk, run phase. But Google does this for example with photos and says, which person is this a picture of? Or Facebook does the same thing, trying to confirm which friend to tag. There are ways to get people to do a little bit of the work for you, as long as you're transparent that they're helping you, what you're using the input for, et cetera. So, Take your users along for this journey with you. Don't try to act like it does more than it can, and they'll probably be willing to help you get things going in the right direction. Mm. Brilliant advice, thank you. Um, cool, uh, question um, probably more for Keith, if that's okay. I've got a question in from uh, Lawrence. Do people feel that you can only use Agile when it centers on iteration using user feedback? Um, uh, yeah, it does, I, I read that, it was a really interesting question. Um, I. I can think of examples uh, where businesses have used things like scaled agile, which I know has its detractors, but it, 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 you know you you can do that without necessarily always looking at user feedback all the time. And actually, just by establishing a two-week sprint heartbeat, even if that is still surrounded by loads and loads of waterfally stuff then it, that could actually still be a good thing. So you, you may not always iterate on feedback every single sprint or every other sprint, but the ways of working could still be improved, I guess. So I hope that, hope that helps answer the question. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know if anyone else had anything they wanted to add on that in terms of using Agile. Yeah, for me, it's less, when I, I talk about Agile a lot in the context of hardware development, actually, and it, it's less about to see the methodology than, and more about the mindset. So I think the good point in the question about feedback and how you can, and it's not necessarily always user feedback, but how you can shorten your iteration cycles uh, it is really important. And that, that comes kind of straight from the, I think the agile world, uh, finding ways to explore the unknown in, in quicker ways and get understanding about which paths to take and which not paths to take when you're kind of doing your product development. And so kind of in the hardware world, things like Raspberry Pis, 3D Ting, these have enabled us to prototype and try new ideas, which allow us to test new things in a lot quicker way than we could kind of if we had to build a full blown kind of hardware version or take it to a machine shop or to a manufacturer to produce. Uh, so yeah, kind of trying to bring that thinking in that, and I like our folks a lot on that type, bringing the iteration circle and feedback loops tighter and tighter and tighter. I mean, it's never going to be as tight in hardware as it is in software, but it's like thinking that mindset and those principles which you can pull across. Brilliant. Um, I'm gonna... Sorry. Oh, can I add something? I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah, please do. I was going to say, Joe, I think Waterfall gets a bit of a bad rap a lot in, in the product space. I, I like to suggest one thing that I use a lot in the product world, which is feature flags. And it's the ability, because it's great to use an agile process and put features out there and, and see how users respond to them. But sometimes it makes sense to launch launch a lot of things as a campaign all at once so users can be brought along for the ride. And again, leaning back on user expectations, it's less random. So I just always encourage people to think not that you need to be constantly drip feeding features to your users, but how can we use feature flags to turn things on as part of a campaign and to get them used to something new without it being sort of um, a random feed of different updates. Brilliant, wise advice. Um, and I think we've done most of our questions and also we are out of time. But if I could just finish by a really heartfelt, genuine, thank you so much to all of our speakers tonight. And um, it's been some amazing insights and experiences uh, shared. And thank you very much for tackling um, everyone's questions as well. And of course, thank you to everyone for joining, for your engagement, your comments and your questions. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.